we're going to kind of read one and or two of these and go through um, the stuff on them. The biggest deal with uh, working with TXVs and most modern comfort cooling equipment is mostly TXVs. A lot of RTUs are still fixed orifices, so keep that in mind. But um, most of your, and even refrigeration, a lot of refrigeration stuff is still fixed orifice. But a lot of your residential comfort cooling stuff tends to be TXVs now. It, it just helps the efficiency go up a little bit. Um, so you need to be mindful on what a TXV does. And all the troubleshooting charts we went over are more based on um, fixed orifices than really TXVs. But the only thing that really changes, and I think I mentioned it during the, cl- the course, but uh, the only thing that really changes is the TXV will modulate to try and uh, make up for the differences in the suction pressure and the superheat. So, you know, if you're a little low in refrigerant, it's going to open up a little bit to try and maintain proper suction pressure and superheat. If it can't, then it'll start to look like a more like an undercharge on a fixed orifice where your superheat starts to rise. But if it's just a slight undercharge, especially on a cooler day where you're subcooling, it stays a little bit closer to where it needs to be because the system's not working as absolutely hard as it has to. Um, it's going to look like it's charged just fine until you actually check, check subcooling. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're troubleshooting with something that has a TXV on it, then you need to um, you need to try and check the TXV and make sure it's working properly. If it looks like you got a liquid line restriction and other issues that may uh, affect the suction side of the system, the evaporator side of the system, uh, won't be as apparent because the TXV is trying to modulate to fix that. Same thing with EEVs. The only difference between an EXV or e- EEV or EXV and a TXV is the EEV is electronic. So instead of having a uh, bulb that reads the temperature of the line, it's going to have a thermistor or some kind of uh, electronic temperature sensor that's going to check the line. And then the pressure is going to be read using um, a transducer or some other means of uh, monitoring uh, suction pressure. So they're going to function essentially the same, but um, in EEV you have to get into more controlled diagnostics if something's not working properly. Uh, Give me just a second. guys saying they're not coming in or whatever so anyway um just just keep that in mind and as we go through this hopefully uh that helps and then what i'll probably do is i'll upload this pdf into google classroom too that way you guys can download it and read it in case you need to look over it again or something like that um but in the meantime while we're talking about it if there's any questions on txvs or anything like that we can answer them and try and get through it the best we can. So, uh, this basically just goes through before the 13 minimum, C or minimum standard TXVs were a lot more rare. And they were, um, you know, even, I guess probably 10 years ago, 5, 10 years ago is when they really started ramping up on TXVs and systems. A lot of times before that, it was fixed orifice. Um, your heat pump outside uh, metering device still might be a fixed orifice these days, although they're starting to move a lot more to TXVs. But, you know, until it got, um, until the efficiency standards started coming up, you didn't have TXVs as often. And then it goes on talking about metering the flow of refrigerant to evaporators, the sole thing that the TXVs got to do got to meter the flow at a precisely the same rate as the refriger- the refrigerant is vaporized by the heat load. So the TXV does this by, by keeping the coil supplied with enough refrigerant to maintain the right superheat of the suction gas leaving the coil. And um, there'll be another example of this equation right here, but I want you guys to take note of this and um, make sure you remember it. So there's three forces that govern the uh, operation of a TXV. All right, there's three there are three forces that are in play. You have P1, which is the power element and the remote bulb pressure. So um, they're not showing it there. I need a better picture. 
All right, so the bulb right here, you guys can see the bulb right there. That is um, that is filled with refrigerant, okay? Uh, depending on the design of the TXV, it's not going to be the same refrigerant that's in the system. But basically, that bulb is just filled with refrigerant, and that refrigerant is going to change pressure with temperature, right? So as the uh, as the temperature changes the pressure on this bulb is going to change how much the force is acted upon this diaphragm at the top you're trying to force the um, force the valve open um, evaporator pressure so that's some people call that back pressure so you have the power element remote bulb pressure then you have evaporator pressure or back pressure so that's the actual the evaporator pressure from the system is going to act upon the TXV back here trying to force the diaphragm closed. So you see the um, the bulb, which would be coming through this tube, is going to try and push down on this. The back pressure is going to try and push up. And then you have P3, which is the superheat spring. And depending on where that that's adjusted, that's going to uh, act on the TXV, forcing it closed. So uh, P1 needs to equal P2 plus P3. So the P1 pressure is going to uh, reach equilibrium. Well, it, the, everything's going to re reach equilibrium once P2 plus P3 equals P1. All right. So the superheat spring pressure and the evaporator pushing back on it and the bulb pressure pushing down. All right. So once those forces are balanced, the TXV will remain in the same position. If they're not balanced or they're changing, it's going to move back and forth. It's going to hunt which we're going to talk about in a minute. But biggest thing I want you to remember is P1 equals P2 plus P3. P1 is your bulb pressure. P2 is evaporator pressure or back pressure. And P3 is your spring pressure. Doesn't show me presenting anything. Yeah, it looks like the screen went blank. Jesus, criminy. I tell you what, if there wasn't, um, there wasn't, oh, now it didn't because I just stopped presenting. All right. Um, all right, present a window. Try this again. All right. This is this, well, it's still waiting. All right, there we go. All right, so let me know if it happens again. I don't know. I mean, I lost my mouse cursor earlier. Uh, nothing wanted to load. Shit was wigging out. You know, I, I don't understand why everything has to be a technical problem with this stuff. I set it up the same way every time. <laughs> anyway, at least I'm finally in that groove. But um, all right, so P1 equals P2 plus P3. Bulb pressure equals evaporator pressure plus spring pressure. The only one you can really control from the outside besides adjusting refrigerant charge is going to be that spring pressure if you have an adjustment. Most residential systems are not going to have a, an adjustment, so you're just going to have to rely on it being set correctly from the factory. So... Uh, as the evaporator outlet temperature becomes warmer, the pressure increases, P1. The pressure on that bulb increases because the pressure goes up because the, uh, the, the temperature goes up, right? So like I said, that bulb is filled with refrigerant. So as the temperature of the suction line goes up, that increases the temperature of the refrigerant in the bulb. Since there's nowhere for it to go, the pressure is going to increase, right? Normal gas law stuff. So... Um, as the evaporator outlet temperature becomes warmer, P1 increases, causing the diaphragm to uh, flex in a downward position. This forces the valve pin into an open position, resulting in increased refrigerant flow. So as the bulb pressure goes up, forces down on the diaphragm, and that forces the valve pin into a more open position, increasing the amount of refrigerant, which is what we want, want right? If the evaporator temperature is getting warmer, then we need more refrigerant because our superheat's going up and we're trying to maintain the proper superheat. So if the superheat goes up, we need more refrigerant. If the superheat goes down, we need less refrigerant. 
The underside of the diaphragm always senses the evaporator pressure, P2, as the pressure increases, it forces the diaphragm in an upward or closing position, decreasing the refrigerant flow. So as the evaporator pressure is going up, in general, that means we've got more refrigerant in there, and we have a higher pressure, so we want to keep that pressure within the range that we're trying to reach, right? The proper evaporator pressure. And the spring pressure also acts on the underside of the diaphragm. The spring is adjusted to provide static superheat for the valve. Static superheat is the amount of superheat needed to initiate movement of the valve pin to start to move. This is design, defined as 0 .002 inches of stroke. So that's how much it's needed to initiate the move. Um, so the amount of superheat required movement to move the pin from the static set point to the rated stroke is called the gradient. Figure 2 depicts how a TXV regulates flow in, in response to a uh, changing refrigerant. So this is Figure 2, and what they're showing is the static superheat and the opening superheat. So this is the most closed position. Some TXVs will be full slam shut closed on no flow. Um, some will have a little bit of move, a, a little bit open. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway, there's the opening superheat. Then notice the rated capacity of the system is going to be in the middle of that curve somewhere. And then the full open capacity is going to be higher than that. So generally, you're going to want a TXV that's going to, where its rated capacity is somewhere going to be somewhere in the middle of its stroke, right? It gives you the most to go back and forth. If you're a little undercharged, a little overcharged, the design conditions change a little bit, you've got a little bit of movement you have to go from here to there. That's why you'll see TXVs a lot of times rated for two and a half and three tons or two, two and a half and three tons or two and a half, three and three and a half tons. You know, they'll have enough movement there. They can handle a few different um, capacities. But in general, you're going to want something that's right there in the middle or so of its rated capacity, where your rated capacity is somewhere in the middle of the TXVs range as far as opening and closing, how much refrigerant it can meter. Um, and then it's talking about starting from the origin. There's no change in valve stroke occurs as it slowly increases. Once the static set point is reached, the valve begins to open from this point forward. Further increase in superheat results in proportional increase in the valve stroke until the maximum stroke is attained. Gradient is important, is important aspect to the system. Too low gradient, the valve would be unstable and it'll tend to hunt more. If the gradient's too high, more superheat will be needed for the valve to open. So again, you're probably going to be somewhere in the middle of that curve. All right, so um, since TXVs control superheat, uh, you got to, uh, how do I put, I'll just read it. All right, so measuring superheat. Since good superheat control is criterion of TXV performance, accurate measurement of the superheat is vital. This involves four steps, um, as shown in figure three. They are measure the suction pressure at the evaporator outlet with an accurate gauge. If a gauge connection is not available, a T can be installed in the equalizer line. Uh, that's a good way if you're trying to troubleshoot something in an evaporator, if it's not too hard to do it, um, which... Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, but it's really nice having a port there at the evaporator. So if you're working on a system where you had to open it up or something and you're dealing with TXV issues or something like that, throw a T in up at that equalizer connection in the evaporator, and then you've got a spot to connect the low side of your gauges right there. Um, sometimes if I'm messing with one where, you know, it's up in an attic and I don't have to want to I don't want to have to run back and forth and I'm changing out the TXV, but I think there might be a couple other things going on. I'll throw a, a, a port on that equalizer line and I'll throw a sight glass right there next to the evaporator because then I can see whether or not I got full column of liquid and whether uh, and what my superheat and everything is right there at the evaporator. So it's not a bad idea if you're already there anyway. It's like 10 bucks to add a T and then you're good to go. Um, refer to the PT chart for the refrigerant used in the system. Find the saturation temperature. Measure the temperature of the suction line at the remote sensing bulb. Uh, this can be done with a strap type thermometer or electronic device. Subtract the saturation temperature. Basically, they're just going through how you properly measure superheat. So hopefully you guys got that by now. But if not, saturation temperature of the refrigerant. 
based on the pressure minus uh, subtracted from the actual temperature of the line you get superheat if you got a txv hopefully superheats between 8 and 12 on comfort cooling systems and then you can refer back to that chart for different types of systems or the manufacturer's literature if they uh, have specific requirements for a system for some reason um so you have internally and externally equalized TXVs. In a system with a small evaporator, the pressure drop across the evaporator is so small you can assume it's zero. Therefore, the TXV um, and evaporator outlet pressures are equal. Um, so if you're talking about really small systems with really small evaporators, you're not going to have a pressure drop because you don't have much piping through the evaporator. So in that point, at that point, you're probably going to have an internally equalized TXV. Um, by drilling a small bleed passage between the underside of the diaphragm and the outlet of valve, you can sense the pressure in, internally and eliminate the need for an external connections. Valves produced in this manner are termed internally equalized. And like I just said, smaller systems, uh, really small um like uh, cooler systems that have a TXV or something like that, you'll have that internally equalized valve. Uh, typically, we're going to have the externally equalized valve where you have that equalizer tube that goes the opposite side of the evaporator. You still won't have much pressure drop through the evaporator, but it's enough that you want to know what the difference is between the inlet and the outlet side of the evaporator. So that's the whole point of... I guess let me go back to this picture... That's the whole point of that thing right there, that loop in the back, right? That you connect to the other side of the evaporator when you're installing a TXV. That, that uh, port right there is to give the TXV the back pressure. So um, the bulb pressure is here, right? Goes to the power head. The back pressure goes to the equalizer line into the TXV right here. And then, um, of course, your spring pressure is underneath right there. Um, with the conventional TXV, the pressure differential across the valve results in a force that tends to open. As operating conditions vary, this pressure differential changes and results in a variation of the original superheat. Engineers have uh, developed the balance ported TXV to compensate for this. So that's figure four. At figure four, so that's a balance port TXV design. So that's that helps. Uh, if you, if you hear the term balance point TXVs, it's basically that it compensates for the um, the differential pressure across the valve. Uh, so in this design, the inlet pressure is applied across the valve pin as well as an undercut on the push rod since these forces are in opposite directions. They counter or balance each other, resulting in no change in superheat regardless of the operating conditions. Balance port valves are ideal for use in systems that operate over large changes in operating conditions. An example of this is commercial AC system that must operate both in winter and summer um, with uh, varying head pressures. So... On troubleshooting TXVs, there's three failure modes you can have in, t in a TXV, basically. If the TXV is not working properly, you're going to be dealing with one of three failure modes. And it basically just um, is what's happening in the evaporator, right? So the first thing that can happen is you have a starving evaporator. So if there's insufficient refrigerant flow caused by high, uh, causing high superheat at the evaporator outlet, if you have high superheat at compressor inlet, high discharge temperatures, and compressor overheating so those are the three things that are going to happen which is anytime you have a high superheat right anytime you have a high superheat you're going to have high superheat the compressor inlet which isn't going to cool it properly that's going to cause your discharge temperature to go up because your compressor is going to add a ton of heat to an already hot line uh, relatively speaking hot line and um, your compressor might overheat in that circumstance because it's getting too hot the other problem is, of course, you're not going to get very good cooling if you're starving the evaporator. The next one that you'll get is flooding. This occurs when the refrigerant flow to the evaporator is so high that it can't evaporate everything within the coil. So then you're going to get a uh, flood back. You're going to get liquid refrigerant back to the compressor. Uh, you're going to have low evaporator superheat. You're going to dilute the oil in the compressor. You're going to get a noisy compressor. If it's not co corrected, you're going to get permanent compressor damage. That's part of the reason slugging is so bad because it basically you end up 
washing the oil out of the compressor. And if you've never seen it on a semi-hermetic with a sight glass, you can sit there and watch on a cold startup with a lot of liquid in the line. It basically, all the oil just washes out of the compressor real fast. And uh, that's a bad thing. So when you're getting slugging or you're getting flooding in the evaporator and you're getting liquid refrigerant back to your compressor, that's what you're doing. A, the compressor can't, um, the compressor can't pump the liquid, right? It's a vapor pump, not a liquid pump. So it can't do anything with that liquid. So basically, uh, it's trying to compress that liquid inside of there. It can't do it, which tends to damage the internal parts. It's going to wash the syst- uh, the oil out of the system, and it's going to be noisy as hell while it's doing it. And if, you, um, if you've never heard it, uh, maybe on a system you're not worried about messing up too much, charge that thing too fast through the suction side line. Like if you're going to... If you're going to pull a system out or something like that and you got a little bit of extra refrigerant and you don't mind recovering, um, just uh, open, act like you're about to charge the system through the suction line, open that liquid valve up all the way and listen for that compressor to start chewing the liquid, all right? And you'll hear what it sounds like when it starts chewing liquid and then remember that sound for later. So if you hear it, you know what it sounds like. If you got a noisy compressor, assume it could be chewing liquid. All right, and then the third failure mode you can have, which is a little bit uh, more common than flooding, uh, TXVs, unless you really overcharge the system or there's an issue with the TXV itself, you usually won't have flooding too much, but you usually have starving or you'll have hunting. Starving, it slams shut because there's no uh, pressure in the sensing bulb and hunting because it's never reaching equilibrium. So on hunting, when the superheat is in, oper- in an operating system is constantly changing from literal no superheat to very high superheat, it's called hunting. You can easily recognize this by noting extreme cyclic changes in the evaporator or suction pressure. Hunting is can be caused by many factors, but it usually occurs when the valve is oversized for the load. Before condemning a valve for this symptom, make certain the evaporator is clear of frost and has proper airflow. Since these conditions will result in very low loads, potentially resulting in a good valve hunt. So if you have airflow issues, remember we were talking about um, low suction pressure, low superheat. Low suction pressure, low superheat is always an airflow issue. 100%, well, not, not necessarily airflow. It's always low evaporator load, right? But in nine times out of those, nine times out of 10 cases of low evaporator load, it's going to be airflow issues. So it's going to be um, issue when the return block, the evaporator cold, dirty, blow wheels, super dirty, something like that. Um, so and whereas low suction pressure, low superheat, that's always what you get. With the TXV, again, it's going to try and adjust. So that low superheat, when you start getting low superheat there, it's going to open up and try and make up for that. So with, uh, with airflow issues or something like that, you may get more hunting then you will get actually low superheat. But um, it'll always err on the side of low superheat. It'll always be more of a low superheat issue than um, a high. You you won't get high superheat, basically. It'll hunt between proper superheat and low superheat, essentially. If uh, if you've got a lot of... uh, frost from it freezing up because you just changed the filter or or it just has a really dirty filter or something like that or ducts are just too small whatever the case may be if you got poor airflow that txv will hunt more often so uh we'll see what they say here and then i'll tell you what i think about checking txv operation all right if a txv is suspected of working properly um, or suspected of not working properly, I would think. Uh, checking the superheat is the only way to know for sure. Do this with accurate instrumentation to get meaningful results. I mean, you should always trust your tools. If you don't trust the measurements on your tools, get better tools or compare them to something till you trust the measurements they're taking. Um, so check the manufacturer's installation and service manuals to verify acceptable superheat. If you're working on comfort cooling equipment, um, residential, 8 to 12 is what you want to kind of look for. Um, If you're working on commercial, you probably want to double check the manufacturer's literature, depending on the size of the system. Um, You know, uh, zero to uh, two to 10 tons, basically. You're probably still still looking at eight to 12 degrees superheat, but that could change. 
you get into bigger equipment. So you always want to double check manufacturer's instructions, but generally if you're eight to 12, you're good. So some tips for troubleshooting TXV performance follow it. Check the bulb to assure it's properly connected to the suction line. If you can move the bulb by hand, then it's not secured adequately. Some manufacturers insulate the bulb to protect it from the effects of an airstream. This was done by the OEM. Make sure the insulation is still intact. Check the equalizer lines for restrictions or kinks or signs of frost. A frosted equalizer line indicates internal leakage and will require placement of the valve. You will need to repair or replace a kinked equalizer as well for the valve to operate properly. Um, a TXV is designed to meter the flow of refrigerant. If the refrigerant at the valve inlet contains flash gas, the capacity of the valve will be reduced. Make certain the system is properly charged and that subcooling, some subcooling exists at the inlet of the valve before condemning the TXV. The use of 410A and POE oils, there is greater risk of dirt and contaminates, contaminants being circulated within the system. Some manufacturers use inlet strainers or screens to prevent debris from clogging the valve. Such a condition is found, clean and replace the strainer. It would also be wise to install a large filter dryer at the inlet of the TXV to prevent a recall. Basically, troubleshooting a TXV boils down to this. If everything else is good and you're sure it's good, always double check everything else first. Um, if your coals are clean, if your charge is correct, you can check that by subcooling if you want. It's nice to be able to double check that with a sight glass if possible. If you're not double checking it that way, maybe weigh the charge back in if you're not 100% sure of yourself. If you're not 100% sure, it doesn't take that long to recover most of the refrigerant and weigh it back in to see with you if you're within a few ounces. You don't have to be dead accurate on to an ounce, especially with the TXV, a little bit shy or a little bit over shouldn't kill you but if you're a pound or two off obviously you need to add refrigerant as long as you have some subcooling a TXV should operate properly um, ideally you want factory subcooling especially on warmer days but if you at least have three four degrees of subcooling that thing should be pretty close but get your subcooling dead accurate just to make sure double check the charge if you can make sure that all your um, coals are clean that all your motors are spinning in the right direction. If you can, double check somehow actual airflow. And that's going to be a separate class. But, um, you know, make sure your airflow is good. Whether it be by checking static pressure, actually measuring airflow, doing a heat rise test. Whatever you got to do. But just do something to make sure your airflow is on. Because you're going to have, um, you're going to have duct problems and nine out of ten of the places you walk into so it never hurts just to double check airflow but if airflow was low your superheat would generally be low if anything or hunt but if your superheat is high and everything else looks good you replace the txv you can pull everything out and check the inlet strainer if you want but by the time you do that you probably might as well just throw the txv in so pull it out Check the inlet strainer just to see if that was it and it wasn't the TXV. Go ahead and change the TXV while you're at it and always put a new filter dryer in when you when you pump down a system and open it up. Put a brand new filter dryer in and yes, if at all possible, put that filter dryer right before the evaporator. That's the best place to have it, right there where you just put everything in. Um, if it, the TXV is brazed in, then use a uh, use a nice oxyacetylene torch to get that thing in it, in there as quickly as possible. Hopefully you have um, some type of screw on connection. But when they're brazed in, do a good job on keeping it cool while you're installing it and everything. But basically, if a TXV is over, I I'd say five to fifteen degrees, right? And five's really pushing it on the low side. Uh, Eight to twelve is where you want to be. Plus or minus a few degrees is okay. If you're below five and everything else is right as far as airflow and all that, which is not going to happen much, but I've seen TXVs uh, regulate too much superheat. And if it's over 15, change it out. And that's basically what it boils down to. If it's not regulating superheat properly, change it. Um, a good method 
of checking to see if the TXV at least moves, which means that there's still some refrigerant left in the bulb, is to pull the bulb off and hold it in your hand or stick it in warm water. Um, and then you should see the TXV stroke open and more refrigerant should go through. Uh, but all that really tells you is it's still moving. So if that bulb is really slowly leaking refrigerant and it's still not quite right and it's running a little bit um, too, uh, if it's running a little bit too far closed, you're still going to have the issue even with it on there, even if it strokes. And I've seen that before too. Just because putting it in your hand gets it to move doesn't mean it's operating. It just means, well, you should probably double check because it's not slam shut. It's just not opening enough. Um, but basically, if it's not maintaining superheat and you know everything else is good, bulb bulb placement is important, you know. Um, I uh, One of the first times I ran into a clogged filter dryer, I put the new filter dryer in. Um, I hadn't changed the TXV yet. I was going to try the filter dryer first just to make sure that was it and then do the TXV if that didn't do it. The guy I had to help him, he didn't put the bulb on very good, and it looked like I still had a bad TXV. Cleaned off where the copper goes on and put the bulb on right, and then I'm good to go. So, I mean, if your bulb's not strapped on there tight to a good, clean piece of copper, you're going to get um, you're gonna get bad readings. It's not going to regulate superheat properly. Uh, the other thing is, really, let me look at this picture right here and look at it pretty close. Really, your bulb should be upstream. Your bulb should be upstream of your equalizer connection. I know a lot of times you don't see it like this, especially where you got a field installed, the TXV. Um, this bulb is going to be downstream. But if you can, that bulb should be placed upstream of your equalizer connection. If it's not placed upstream of it and it's downstream, you should be fine because you shouldn't have much pressure drop. But if you have any issues in this suction line before that, um, before where that bulb's placed, that's going to affect your reading, right? If you got a little bit of a restriction because, say, this was a 90 and the 90's kinked a little bit or something like that, that's going to have an effect on the TXV operation. The other thing is um, if you've got an issue where uh, your evaporator is getting a lot of oil in it because you don't have properly sized lines or you don't have very good oil return, your evaporator is below your condenser. There's not there's not proper oil traps in the system where they need to be on the refrigerant line. If you're dealing with issues like that, then um, when you get oil inside that evaporator, if the bulb is placed on the underside of the suction line, that is going to um, that's going to affect your reading too, because it'll basically be reading that temperature through the oil so it's not getting getting good contact with the refrigerant which is why generally you're at uh 10 or 2 you know what i mean the txv should be you know 45 degrees one way or the other not on the direct top of the line but nowhere along the bottom half so that's your best placement for it if you've got good oil return and proper charge, even that shouldn't matter. Even if the bulb is not placed in the super correct position, if your lines don't have enough, don't have a lot of pressure drop, and you don't have oil return issues, it shouldn't matter where it's at on that suction line, really. But in case those issues do come up, you know, down the road, you've got a little bit of oil return issues, or something happened, and you sent a bunch of oil through the system, that's going to affect the TXV operation. So that's why good practice is. Uh, 10 and 2 on a horizontal line or on the vertical line. The other thing that um, the other thing that people generally recommend is the tail. If you look at the other side of that sensing bulb, is there a picture of that? I don't think so. No, you can't see it. So right here on this TXV, where the, this is one of the ones that are like a, a steel bulb line. Um, on the copper ones, there'll be a tail where they filled it. I think on these ones, they fill it over here on this end and then spin that closed. But anyway, there'll be a tail where they fill it with the refrigerant. In general, good practice is to put that tail up. Um, 
I don't think it's the most important thing in the world, but it, it you're trying to keep the refrigerant, you're trying to keep it inside the bulb. Huh? What's that? Oh, did it? Okay. Okay. So I will, um... Which one? You're lying. I don't see it. Alright, what well, does... Huh? All right. Um, anyway. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Yeah, that one. Right? That one has the tail on it. So on that, where that tail is, where they fill it with the refrigerant, you generally want that up. And then if you're putting on a vertical line, you want that tail to be facing up. And the reason is you're trying to keep all the refrigerant in the bulb. So as much refrigerant as possible is sensing that line temperature. It just makes the pressure a little bit more accurate throughout it. Um, I can't say that I've ever thought I had an issue associated with that, but that's considered best practice. Best practice is to put that tail up, especially if you're going to have the TXV, if you're going to place the bulb really far away from the TXV and it's going to be on a vertical line, you put the tail up so that all the refrigerant stays in the bulb and it kind of doesn't migrate over the diaphragm. That's the, uh, that's the official explanation there. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, that's, so ideally tail up, bulb place before the equalizer line and then everything nice and clean right there at the inlet. If not bulb on the equalizer line, or, uh, upstream of the equalizer, then 10 and 2 on a horizontal section of pipe is next best. And then next best is a vertical section of pipe if you need to. Uh, I know it says if the manufacturer insulated the bulb, I can't remember a manufacturer never wanting you to insulate the bulb. It's it's very rare that you're going to have a situation where they're like, nah, it doesn't matter where it's insulated. Um, usually it's not the biggest difference in the world if it's not insulated, but it's still a difference, especially depending on the EVAP temp and what the temperatures are inside that coil. So you want to keep that thing insulated. You want to keep it insulated well. So make sure that um, it's insulated where that bulb contacts the refrigerant line. And then um, another couple tips is where that equalizer line goes and where that bulb line goes. Make sure it's not rubbing on any metal or anything like that that's eventually going to eat a hole through it. Uh, that's really common inside the tight evaporators and stuff where... You know, you can see the line rubbing up against the coil or something somewhere where eventually you know it's going to it's gonna cause a hole in the system. And if a hole in the sensing bulb will kill the TXV, a hole, a hole in the equalizer line will drain all your refrigerant out. So neither one of them is good. Um, all right, replacing a TXV, make sure it's the same capacity, uh, same capacity for the system, right refrigerant, Proper charge type, uh, it make sure it's internally or externally equalized, same one. Internal check valve, if it's applied on the original valve, which a lot of the times it will be. And then inlet, outlet, connection, size, and type needs to be the same. Um, in general, try and get the OEM valve. Uh, you don't have to. It's, a good, uh, it's good to be able to choose a TXV off the shelf and know what you're doing. But if you're not, if you haven't gone past this class and read more about TXVs and make sure you understand what the ratings are from Sporlin or Emerson or whatever the case may be, then um, go with just buy this valve from the manufacturer to make sure you get it right. It'll make your life a whole lot easier if you don't know what you're doing, subbing out valves. But in general, a TXV that's rated for three tons, that's good for 410A is good for the next three ton 410a system as long as you can get it in there and everything is going to work good uh, ideally if you're going to put one in and it's not the oem one i would probably try and get one that's adjustable too because that gives you a little bit of room to work with if everything's not perfect 
because OEM valves are sometimes out of spec and nothing drives me nuts more than a valve that seems like it's working fine, but I can't get it to get to about 10, 12 degrees of superheat where I want it. It's very annoying. Um, but it's not the end of the world as long as you're somewhere within a good range. Um, and like I said, it, it says it again right there. Make sure that your filter dryer is uh, as close as possible to that TXV. The only thing I hate about some of the system manufacturers, the ones that are throwing the liquid line dryers inside the condenser, I'd much let, rather be able to put that liquid line dryer right there before the indoor unit every time. That's where it should be. Uh, then it goes through TXVs with heat pumps. You can read that on your own time if you want, but it basically it's the same thing. Um, at the TXV, if you got two TXVs, it doesn't really matter. You, you, your heat pump, your TXV and your heat pump does the same thing as the TXV on the indoor unit. Um, you'll have an internal bypass in most TXVs. That's why if you ever look at your evaporator coils when you're ordering them, a lot of times they'll say AC and heat pump, or it'll be just an AC evaporator coil. But most residential systems, at least these days, uh, they almost always have the check valve inside. So if the refrigerant's going the other direction, then it will allow the refrigerant to go through that direction without going through the, the, the orifice of the TXV. So it won't meter the refrigerant in the opposite direction. Um, and then, so that's one of them. And then this is the other one. This is the one I always used to uh, read out of. Uh, it says most of the same information in it. Um, it gives you a little bit more on the troubleshooting side. So we'll read through some of these troubleshooting sections real quick. And then um, we can talk about any of them. So causes of flooding in a TXV. So causes of flooding include undersized or an inefficient compressor. So if you have uh, this compressor is not the right size, I don't know how that happens. That's a pretty rough day if you find out it's the wrong size compressor. But if it's inefficient, if the compressor is not working properly, that it can cause flooding in the uh, refrigerant system. And really it's not, I don't like to think of it as flooding. I like to think of it as um, Basically, the compressor's not pumping, so liquid's just sitting in there everywhere. That's how I like to think about inefficient compressors. It might not be the best way to think about it, but really, I don't think of that as an issue with the TXV. But uh, uh, it can look like the TXV's flooding if you have an inefficient compressor. Uh, if the superheat setting on the valve is too low, then it'll flood. Um, if there's moisture in the system, any moisture in the system can make it look like it's flooding or starving or anything. It'll it'll create it'll block up that TXV and cause it to be locked in a particular position as it's freezing at the inlet of the TXV. So moisture in the system just will make a TXV look bad six six different ways. But generally, you'll see if there's moisture in the system, you're going to see signs of non-condensable, some flux. Uh, pressure fluctuation and things like that that should hopefully tip you off that it's not the TXV. Um, you see those head pressure fluctuations and you know it's non-condensables. Uh, dirt or debris, anytime you got dirt or debris in there, if it actually gets past the inlet strainer, it could get lodged between the pin and the port and cause it to stay open too far. Uh, if the seat's leaking on the TXV, so if the pin and port do not seat properly, the liquid will flow right through it. Uh, it might be dirt and debris. It might be that something got damaged while it was being installed. Um, it, if the TXV seat is leaking, though, then it's not going to be able to properly uh, close down. If the valve's oversized, um, you know, if the valve's been replaced recently or ever, uh, make sure that they put in the proper size valve because the oversized valve will flood the system. If the bulb position is incorrect, you're going to get flooding. That's probably your most common one right there is incorrect bulb position. Um, and then the next one is probably just going to be uh, basically wrong or moisture in the system or something like that. Starving causes a starving would be moisture, dirt or debris, insufficient delta P across the valve. Um, 
So there's instances where you're in, you don't have enough pressure drop across something like a solenoid valve or something like that to get it to operate. Um, and that's like the system, the system goes into shutdown, the pressures equalize and it takes a second for that solenoid to open because it has to have a pressure drop to open a solenoid. Um, if the charge is really low and you don't get enough of a pressure drop, it's not going to work properly, a solenoid valve. Um, the TXV is the same way. You have to have some kind of pressure drop across that valve for it to operate. I can't think of many instances where you'll actually run across it, but just keep it in mind. Uh, a lot of things like uh, solenoid valves and uh, reversing valves and uh, TXVs, with the in the case of solenoid and reversing valves, they'll be called pilot operated. If it's a pilot operated valve and a TXV, it's just the the nature of its operation. But a lot of those things require some kind of pressure drop across them for them to operate properly. So if you got a really low charge or even a really high charge, sometimes that can create not enough pressure drop for them to work right. So if something else is wrong, don't condemn valves until you get the other things in line. Undercharge system, of course, is going to cause starving and flash gas at the inlet of TXV, so improper subcooling or other things that cause flash gas at the inlet. Um, if you got, uh, obviously, before you condemn a TXV, always, always, always check for a uh, liquid line pressure drop, a liquid line restriction outside of the TXV. You always check for a liquid line pressure, uh, a liquid line restriction first. If the, there's no liquid line restriction, then it's a metering device issue. Um, uh, you can look for bubbles in a sight glass. Like I said, if you're doing something, you're adding a filter dryer and stuff, it doesn't hurt to add a sight glass. That also gives you a good moisture indicator. Um, look for forest moisture on the liquid line. Really just measure your temperature drop across your whole liquid line and then check for proper subcooling. Uh, plug the equalizer line will cause um, starving because you're not going to have that back pressure. Um, if the valve is too small, if the superheat is adjusted too high, or the power assembly fails. So power assembly failure is a big one. Plugged equalizer lines a possibility. I can't say I've ran across one, but it's a good possibility you can have a plugged or a kinked equalizer line. Um, Valve too small if it's been replaced. Those are going to be your um, those are going to be your common reasons for starving on a TXV. And then hunting, hunting occurs when it, uh, the TXV is going to be alternately operating open and closed. <clears throat> Causes a hunting could be the valve is oversized, the bulb location is incorrect, refrigerant distribution, um, the distributors coming off the TXV. If you have uh, circuits with uh, differing loads inside the evaporator, so you've got multiple evaporator circuits, and a bunch of those circuits are operating at different uh, loads, essentially, because there's different amounts of air going across them. So if the, distri if the distributors, if you got like one distributor kinked or something like that, especially, um, you could have some overfeeding uh, at the other ones and then underfeeding at that one. I've never seen it, but I've seen uh, people bring it up before. They got problems on the distribution after the TXV, especially if it was a retrofitted TXV in a commercial system or something like that. Any problems with the, uh, the distributors coming off the outlet of the TXV can cause issues. The superheat adjustment is wrong. So if you haven't adjusted the superheat properly and it's turned up too high or too low, you you can get some hunting and then moisture. Of course, moisture can do any of those. Moisture can cause the TXV to look all kinds of out of whack. But again, you should see signs, hopefully, of non-condensables if that's the issue. So, that is those troubleshooting manuals on TXVs. And those have always been kind of my favorite to just go over stuff quickly uh, so that you got good bearings. If you understand at least what's in those two PDF documents, or really just that second one or that first one, if you understand that uh, about TXVs, you're pretty much good enough to to know what's going on when you're trying to work on a system with a TXV. So 
Uh, is there any questions about what we went through on TXVs? Talk too fast or anything, or you didn't understand something, or something along those lines. No? All right. All right, somebody's lying, but I don't know who, so no big deal. All right. Um, so what I kind of wanted to do that I'm not going to bother with right now, um, remember P1 plus P2, uh, P1 equals P2 plus P3. Uh, you might want to look through that manual a couple more times. I will add some questions on one of these tests on TXVs. That is a guarantee. Um so make sure you got that down. The other thing I kind of wanted to go into tonight, but I just I just don't really have time, but I want you guys to do on your own time a little bit. I'm going to go through a few of these, and then I want you guys to get on Google or something, do some Google Foo, and I want you to look at different refrigeration components. All right? There's other things that we have not discussed that could be in a refrigeration circuit. There's tons of them. So we've only really talked about, you know, the condenser, the metering device, the compressor, and um, the evaporator. There is obviously, uh, I think, the ne uh, your filter dryer. We've talked about the filter dryer. So we've got that covered too. But we have, uh, we've only talked briefly about check valves on refrigeration troubleshooting. I think I brought them up. You know, if you have a TXV that doesn't have an internal check valve, then you could have an external check valve in the system that just keeps refrigeration refrigerant from going the wrong direction. Um, uh, we may have mentioned suction line dryers briefly, but you can have a suction line dryer just like you can have a filter dryer on the liquid line. Uh, generally, your suction dryer is going to be there if you had an issue on the compressor. Uh, your next most common for residential is probably an accumulator. So an accumulator on the suction line to make sure that you do not get liquid refrigerant into the compressor, hopefully, unless it's grossly overcharged. Um, then your next most common is probably a receiver. So a liquid line receiver, which I don't... Yeah, they got one pictured right here. So there's a liquid line receiver. Um... Then with high efficiency systems, I would actually say your muffler on the discharge line is probably your next most common. Um, your sight glass is pretty common, right? So this uh, liquid indicator or sight glass. Solenoid valves are probably your next most common component. Um, the solenoid valve could be on the liquid line at exiting the condenser on long piping runs or... Uh, refrigeration systems it could be a defrost and this is showing a refrigeration system right here so there is a uh, solenoid in between the discharge line and the evaporator and that solenoid would come on when that evaporator needs to be defrosted you got hot gas defrost uh, ball valves high low pressure controls this one shows an oil separator so you could have an oil separator um, you don't see those too much except on larger systems, large VRFs might, I think they have oil separators. I know they got oil equalization lines. They might not have separators, but you're going to have oil separator on the discharge line to try and keep the oil back in the compressor. If it's getting pumped out, um, there might be an oil filter in there. If you've got it, an oil pressure regulator or oil pressure switch could be in there. Um... And there's a few more. You can have EPR, an evaporator pressure regulator. Um, so evaporator pressure regulators are often used on um, commercial refrigeration and uh, cases and stuff like that. So if you have cases working at different temperatures, you maintain a specific evaporator pressure. Uh, I've seen evaporator pressure regulators used um, on some... Uh, crack style units to try and maintain um, proper evaporator pressure so that you don't get uh, freeze ups 
And so it'll maintain evaporator pressure that's at least above 32 degrees so that you don't have freezing, so you don't have to worry about any issues there most of the time unless there's a really major issue. Um, what else? I can't think of any more off the top of my head. Pressure switches and stuff, obviously. Uh, we'll talk about transducers and things like that that might be in the line, but that really ties back into controls. But basically what I want you guys to do is try and look up other components that you might have in the refrigeration circuit and learn what they do because it's important when you look into a unit uh, reversing valve. We didn't even talk about reversing valves in that whole thing, right? But you could also have a reversing valve in there. Basically, any th anything that's in that circuit, you want to know what it does, especially if it's a tank like a receiver, an accumulator, or something like that. That's also going to mean you have to have extra charge in the system to, to mitigate that. So, um, you know, if you add an accumulator or you add a suction line dryer, uh, because of a burnout, you have extra refrigerant you need to put in the system because of the capacity of that component. Um, generally, with solenoids and stuff like that, it's so minimal. It's basically just line set, right? But um, on bigger things that hold a decent volume of refrigerant, it'll change the charge on the system. But um, if you don't, if the if you don't know what you're doing when it comes to a king valve. If you don't know what you're doing when it comes to uh, liquid line receivers or suction line accumulators or um, mufflers or, you know, any of those things we just talked about, solenoid valves, things like that, try to look some of those up on your own time. And then if you got questions about some of them, let me know and we can talk about them. But it's not that hard to find lists. Just Google, you know, refrigerant uh all the components in a refrigeration system or something like that. You know, that's basically how I pulled up that little picture is just looking on Google for different components. And I've done this a few times, you know, just looked up what are the things that could be in a system besides the ones that I'm used to. And that's how I learned about half of them. You know, uh, I don't work on many systems with hot gas defrost, but I know how it works because I've looked up hot gas defrost before and solenoid valves and made sure I understood how those things worked. So do that a little bit. And if there's one that particularly interests you or you don't understand and you've seen before or something like that, let me know. And we can talk about them before or after a class one day so that you've got a good feel for all the other things you might run into. Uh, the most interesting ones I think are uh, evaporator pressure regulators uh, receivers, if you learn what, um, learn about the different types of defrost and things like that, which we might go over, um, basically anything that's mechanical or you're going to be your more interesting ones, your head pressure controls. Um, but other than that, you should still know what every component does. If you look at a refrigeration circuit and you don't understand what one of the things in there does, then you need to understand it because you need to know if it can be affecting the system somehow. Most of them won't, but, you know, an EPR will. An EPR will make a big difference on how everything else reads after it. So you need to understand it. So that's your homework. Homework is look up all the components, Google some stuff on your own time, and let me know if you got any questions about what you look up.